Oh, good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Debo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. If you're in the neighborhood, love to see you here at the church. Come out to 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. If you ever get the opportunity or if you don't have a church, we'd love to have you here. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into uh, the last chapter of the book of Galatians. Gracious Father, we're praying, Lord, for the Holy Spirit to just fall upon us, Lord, to give us understanding of your scripture, Lord. We pray that he lead us and guide us as, as uh, he teaches us, Lord, your truth, Father. May we have understanding, Father, through your spirit. And Lord, may we have the will and the strength Father, to apply the scriptures to our lives, Father. Lord, use me, Father, for your glory, for the experiences that I've had in my Christian faith. And Lord, whatever is biblical and whatever is true, let those things, Father, come out of my mouth. And whatever is not that comes out of my mouth, Lord, just throw it to the wayside. Let it fall on deaf ears, Lord. We just want what is biblical, Father, in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, good morning. Thank you for joining us. We're in the book of Galatians, so grab your Bible, highlighter, pen, and let's begin with chapter 6 of Galatians. Brethren, Paul using that word tells us that he's speaking to Christians, right? Not to non-Christians, but to believers in Christ Jesus. What constitutes a believer? Somebody who has surrendered their life to Jesus and are born again. What does it mean to be born again? It means that they have a new perspective in life. Uh, the old perspective is gone. And their desire now is to change daily uh, before the Lord. And they change according to the scriptures. I remember uh, there was one year where where I realized that there are times in my life where I take on new things like sports or uh, activities. And I find that when I get bored of them, I just discard them. I actually have a, a bag full of softball equipment. It's just sitting up in my attic right now. I used to play softball uh, three times a week. And we had a softball team for the church and I got really involved with that. But then once I got bored, it just all sits up in the in the attic, and I realize that in my whole in my whole life, I've done that with certain things. I, I I pursue them with everything I have, and I really go at it, and then all of a sudden I get bored and I stop. And I thought to myself, Lord, will I do that with Christianity? Will all of a sudden there be a day where all of a sudden I get bored with it and I'll stop? And so one of my prayers was, Lord, don't let me ever stop. And take me home before that happens. I don't want to all of a sudden in the middle of the race just decide, stop, you know. I, and that's the heart of a believer. He wants to constantly Amen. be growing and changing. So he says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, which is sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So here's an interesting thought in Paul's life. And he's encouraging the Galatians here that there are those in the church that are falling into sin. Uh, they're falling by the wayside. The seed hasn't maybe penetrated the soil of their hearts yet. And they're so struggling, whether it's the enemy, whether it's the cares of this world, they're struggling. And so those of you who have struggled, those of you who have the experience and are mature, you need to go to them and, and help them, encourage them, strengthen them, but do it in gentleness. Do it in love, and hopefully they'll receive you in that. But be careful because you can also fall into their sin if you do so. You know, if you decide that maybe the brother here is is falling back into drinking because you see him going into a bar, and if you're not spiritual enough, you should not be going into that bar because you might start off going into the bar and, and trying to get him to get out of the bar, but you find yourself going in every day, talking to him, trying to encourage him, and. And then you know, everyone's drinking around you. They're having their peanuts. The conversation is not Christian. And, and you're there going every day, every day, every day, every day. And so your conversation all of a sudden changes from Christian to maybe bar talk. And then one day they offer you a drink because it's someone's birthday. And you go ahead and you take it. You know, And now you find yourself in the sin that you were trying to deliver them from. And so be careful 
when you try to help someone out that you don't fall back into that sin or fall into that sin also. I think this is wisdom. And I think that those of us that are spiritual should correct people. That's, that's our responsibility to do so and be willing to be corrected too at the same time because we're all growing together. Uh, and that's something that we should decide in our own minds. I think we really need to think about this. And let's think about it right now. Are we willing to be corrected? Are we willing to correct? Because those are the two areas that we're not willing to do all the time. We really aren't. If you're honest with yourself, we don't like to correct people. We'd rather let someone else do it and get in trouble. <laughs> and we don't like being corrected because we feel little. We feel stupid. We feel like maybe they're picking on us. And that's not true either. Uh, so there's some stigmas that come with, with those those two items and we need to make up in our own mind make that choice in our own mind yes i want to be corrected even if it feels funny even if it hurts even if it's true and even if it's not true i still want to be corrected at least someone has has uh, the courage to correct me i should at least respect that and receive it and then make my choice whether it's something that i should apply to my own life like the other day um this was several weeks ago uh, one of the sisters came into the uh, out to the back when they were leaving and she says you know just a quick correction on the on the bulletin you know the the parentheses and she gave me the the grammar application and definition of why you put things in parentheses she goes usually you don't put them in parentheses and I'm like oh I didn't know that thank you I'll remove it immediately and she looked at me she like was surprised she goes wow usually the pastor would just get defensive right away I'm like why would I get defensive you just taught me something I just learned something that's good for me to learn something. It was, yeah, it, it was, but that's not what usually happens. So we have to make the decision to say, hey, they're trying to help me grow. Are there some people that are really just nitpicking? Yeah, sometimes, but forget that. They'll, they'll, they'll hit somebody that they're nitpicking that will let them have it, you know, down the road, but you just receive it. And if it's, if it's good advice, then receive it. If it's not, water's off a duck's back. Just go, okay, thank you, brother, you know? Like I didn't, I, I remember, one time I taught a message, I can't remember what it was out of, it might have been out of Peter talking about the devil, and he came up to me and says, you know, you should have went down this road, you know, because the devil and blah, 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 blah. And I says, thank you, you know, next time I will go down that road. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I didn't have enough time. I can't go down every road that someone thinks of because they all have different roads, and that's where the Holy Spirit's ministering to you. Maybe you need to go down that road in your own studying. So as a pastor, you can't hit every road. In fact, it's suggested that you don't because your message would be very lengthy and all over the place because you can go down a lot of roads and that's called rabbit trails. You need to stick with the main point and keep that main point. And so there was some advice that I said, well, thank you, I appreciate that. But in my mind, I'm thinking that's impossible. I can't touch every subject, though your subject is valid. I just can't do that. So you have to be able to be honest with yourself you know, in receiving and then also um, giving. Um, when you give that correction, you know, you, like Paul says here, do it in gentleness. Do it because you're trying to restore them, not trying to hurt them. You're trying to make them a better person. And sometimes doing, saying those things is good. You know, I'm trying to help you. You know, think about this. Think about what you're saying. Think about what you're doing. It's because we want to be better. You know, we want to reflect Christ more. So I need to change in these areas. And oftentimes you have Christians that are young and they're coming out of the world and they still have the world thoughts, right? So like cussing and swearing, that's part of the world. I mean, come on, everybody does. You stand in the grocery lines, the cashier will cuss and swear. Mm -hmm. People behind you cuss and swear. Should that be a part of the Christian world? No, no, because that's not appropriate. Uh, that's belittling. That's swearing on someone's name or on a thing when we should be trusting in God. It's frustration, it's anger, it's all of those sins that come out of our mouths. And so those are the things that we should be looking at and saying, Lord, help me to get rid of that swearing. You know, like replacing them with different words, you know, instead. But even th that, you see that there's still a frustration in our hearts, you know, and so dealing with that issue because it comes out of anger. I remember a story of a, a Marine <clears throat> had retired and uh, the story went, Pastor Chuck told, told the story, the story went that he became a believer and he would cut his grass 
<clears throat> in the front, and he said the whole time just cussing and swearing, cutting this ground. They would stop the motor, the rocks would fly, cussing and swearing. And as he was growing in the Lord, one day as he was worshiping and, and, and growing in the Lord and just had an epiphany, a divine appointment with God, just touched his heart with joy and peace. And one day he was just mowing the lawn and he was just uh, whistling away and got his lawn done. And he stopped and he said, wow, I didn't say one cuss word at all. And he realized that his life was changing. You know, he didn't have that same personality anymore. And that's what the Holy Spirit does, and we should need to be willing to do that. So, so being gentle in your correction with others, considering yourself. Uh, then he goes on in verse 2, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, bearing one another's burdens. The second law is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, you bear a lot of your own burdens. You know your own faults. How many times do you cuss and swear in your mind, and only you and God hear it? How many times do you complain in your own mind, and only you and God hear it? You know, so if you're struggling with something and you're trying to correct someone else, maybe you need to not correct them. You need to work on it yourself and then come back later and correct them. I'll let that one sit for a little bit. Because <laughs> I find myself in that a lot of times where I see something and then I realize, oh, I do that too. I need to stop that first before I go correct them. So bearing one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something right? We're all something. In other words, you think you're something. When he is nothing, he deceives himself. Thinking that you're something really shows that you're nothing because all you're doing is thinking of yourself. We're all nothing. In light of Christ, we're nothing. What rights do we have? We have no rights at all. The only thing that we have going for us is that God loves us and his grace is pouring on us. Do we have a right to breathe? Are we like someone so special that we can actually say, I have a right to breathe. You can't take my life from me, God. Who do you think you are? No, he's God. He created you. No, we don't have rights. There are some people that when you say, how's it going? And they'll answer, it could be a lot worse. <laughs> I could be going to hell without Jesus Christ right now. Yeah, wow, what a perspective, right? Amen. You know? Sometimes I'll hear people answer this way. I don't have much wisdom. I'm nobody, but this is what I've learned. Maybe it can help you. I don't know. That's humility. You know, they're not anybody. Where some others are, this is what I've learned, and if you pay attention, I'll teach you something, and you'll become wiser. It's like, that's someone who thinks there's something. You know, now there's some truth to that, right? But it's the attitude behind it. I know everything, right? Talk to a teenager. They know everything, right? You ever want some wisdom and guidance? Go to a teenager, because they know everything. Because there's something. And our school systems are designed to, to make them know everything, right? They know everything. They don't need their parents. Just go to Google. Figure it out yourself. Who needs mom and dad? They're lying to you. So that's why it's important that mom and dad don't lie. And they tell the truth. Because we're creating children that are dependent on other things besides the wisdom of their parents. So this is pretty clear. Look, if you think you're something, you're really nothing in the eyes of God. So I think it's better to think that we're nothing and know that we're something in God's eyes because he loves us. We're all created in his image. He has a purpose and a plan for us. Uh, and those are the things that uh, we need to look at and nothing else because we're his instruments of righteousness. Otherwise, and this is what it says here in the last statement, he deceives himself. And so if you're listening to me and you're going, yeah, but... But I am something, you know, I'm a heart surgeon and I save patients lives, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, you're deceiving yourself. You're not hearing what I'm saying. You know, yeah, you're a doctor. You went through the education, but that's by the grace of God. He's giving you the mind because not everyone has that mind. That's Amen. a gift from God. So you need to be grateful that God has given you that gift. You're nothing. He could have given that gift to someone else. And in fact, he did. He gave it to you instead of me. You know, so he could have given it to someone else besides you. So you're nothing. You're deceiving yourself. And so that's why he says in verse 4, but let him which one examine his own work. And then he will be have rejoicing in himself alone and in not another's matter. So um, <clears throat> the peace and the rejoicing comes when you know, hey, I'm a sinner, but you know what? God is using me. God is using me. And I know many pastors who who 
are not the greatest as speakers, but yet they're humble and they go, I'm just a sinner and I'm just trying to be used. And God uses them in mightily ways. People get saved. Examine yourself first. And I think that is true in everything we do. You know, whenever we're going to confront someone, ask yourself first, am I doing that? Is that an area that I'm weak in? So let me be careful here as I try to correct someone else. Let, uh, for each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. That's pretty clear, right? Who's the teacher? Huh? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> Let him who is taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. So Paul is talking about the teacher. You could be a pastor. You could be a Sunday school teacher. There's Teacher's Appreciation Day for all the school teachers, right? If you're teaching, then people who are taught should what? Appreciate those teachers. And Paul here is talking about the pastor. Look, if you have a good pastor and he's teaching well, then appreciate him. There's other places that say that you ought to share. If you're being blessed because of his teachings, for instance, we know somebody that's, that has just lost someone they love very dearly. But if they would have been taught earlier on in life there's a way of living, they would have been blessed right now. But because they didn't, you know, they, because they weren't taught and because they decided to just do it the way they wanted to, they're not blessed. So you think, you think back and you go, how appreciative I would have been if someone would have told me don't do it that way. And if I would have done it the right way, then I'd be okay right now. So there's those blessings that you get. And so if you're blessed because there's good teachers and they've changed your life and blessings come from it, you ought to bless them too. That's what the Bible says. I'm not asking for blessings, by the way. It comes from God. I'm just interpreting the scriptures here, so don't take it personal. Don't attack. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For if he sows to the flesh, he will reap to the reap corruption. But if he sows to the spirit, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. A very clear principle taken from agricultural. You plant corn seeds, you get corn. You plant grape seeds, you get grapes. If you plant spiritual good things, if you're loving and kind, you'll get loving and kindness back from the Lord. If you're gentle and meek, then you'll get gentle and meekness back from other people and from the Lord. If you're wicked and evil, you'll get wicked and evil things from the Lord. If you plant good thoughts and encouraging, then you'll get encouragement and good thoughts back. So whatever you plant, you'll also reap. If you plant bad things, you're going to get bad things. So there is something to say about positive thinking and, and trusting and putting faith in God so that you get the same in return. Now, it could also be here that in the context, you know, he's, he's saying here, you know, if you're being taught, then you should share all good things with those who are taught. So if you, if you sow that way, then you'll also get blessings for it. Therefore we, or therefore as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are in the household of faith. Especially to who? My brother and sisters. Especially to them. Now, this scripture was dear to us when we had our uh, Calvary Care Ministries. We called it Bless and Be Blessed. And it was designed to meet the needs of the body of Christ. And I was in charge of it when I was a young believer after a couple of years. Um, and I would get groceries and we would make bags and we would give them to the people that either lost their jobs, especially construction workers. Uh, they received a lot of food because their job was, you know, they would have work and then they wouldn't have work and so forth. So we would hand out a lot of food to construction workers and they were a part of the church and so it was always to them first and then if we had any leftovers we went to the outside world after that so he says especially to the household because that makes sense if you can't love your brother how are you going to love the world it's true. <laughs> right yeah how are you going to love the world if you can't love your own brother that you work with hand in hand that is a christian believer in christ that you're supposed to have in common and so forth so love them first, and then you can love others. See, see what large letters I have written to you with my own hands. Now, some suggest it's because he has eye problems. Remember how he said he had thorn in his side, uh, and possibly his eyes were 
the thorn in that side, and so he couldn't see, so he had to see his letters and write very big, and that's probably why Luke wrote for him. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross's sake. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but by desire to but they desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in their flesh. And again, he's, he, he, he is feeding off of what he said earlier, you know. Look, if you think you're something, but the reality is you're nothing. If you're a Judaizer and you're trying to get people to be baptized or be circumcised into Judaism, and yet you can't even keep the law. The fact is you can't even keep those things, and yet you expect them to keep it. You know, that's not a good uh, way of living. It's not a good perspective. It's not examining yourself. But God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but the new creation. So here he's saying it's the born again experience that is important. <clears throat> you can be circumcised, it don't mean nothing. You can live with a rich family, don't mean nothing. You can be uncircumcised, it doesn't mean anything. You can live in a poor family and you think you have access to God. You know, I love it, everyone's going to heaven, universalism. Mm -hmm. That's what that is, universalism. Everyone goes to God, why? Because I believe in the God. So that means you're going to heaven? No, Jesus is the only way to, to heaven. You know, when someone comes to someone, you know, usually funerals, right? They, they live an evil, life in this world and someone dies and they get up there and they share the wonderful stories you know and how we got drunk together and i remember this and that and well i'll see him again in heaven that is such a lie from the pit of hell he will not see him in heaven again because they're not going to heaven unless they have jesus christ and paul makes that very clear here it's not circumcision it's not uncircumcision it's not because you're an american citizen that you're going to heaven it's not because of your race. It is because you are circumcised of the heart. You've received Jesus Christ into your life. You are born again. He goes on, From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. A Amen. So his hope was that they would stop bothering him concerning these things of grace and law. So it's a great little book. I encourage you to read it again. And pull out those little golden nuggets that God has for, for us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. We pray that you go before us today, Lord, and number our steps. And Lord, that we would be sensitive to your spirit as he works in our lives, Father. Help us not to think of ourselves as something, but Lord, as nothing. And allow you, Lord, to lift us up. We are valuable in your eyes, Lord, because you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us, Lord. We thank you for that, Lord. And may we receive Jesus into our hearts today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We will see you on Friday. If you have no church to go to tonight, this Wednesday night, join us. We're here in Harupa Valley at 5383 Martin Street. We'd love to have you here. We will be in the Book of Numbers, chapter Five. Have a wonderful day.